Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, let me welcome you. Uh, my name is uh, Martin Eichenbaum, and I'm the director of the Crown Family Center for Israel and Jewish Studies at Northwestern University. My other job is uh, professor of economics. But on behalf of the center, I, I want to welcome all of you uh, to the Philip M. and Ethel Klatznik Lecture. Uh, this year, we're really privileged to have a very innovative program led by, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Psoy Korolenko and Anna Sternis. Uh, let me just say, just on a personal note, that this evening has great significance for me uh, since my father was an officer in the Soviet Army during World War II. So I'll be thinking of him, and like many of you, of the lost world tonight. Um, Uh, the evening is co-sponsored with our longtime partners, the Jewish United Federation of Metropolitan Chicago, so I'm particularly delighted to welcome Paula Harris, who is the Associate Vice President of Community Outreach and Engagement for the Jewish United Fund of Metropolitan. Um, um, so, did you want to make some opening remarks and then I'll introduce Claire, is that okay? Let's do it that way. Let's okay. do it that way. I was going to introduce Claire, but you probably oh, have you more. No, no, no. You have more to say. No, no, no. So thank you, Professor uh, Eichenbaum. As he mentioned, I'm Paula Harris, representing uh, the Jewish United Fund of Metropolitan Chicago, which also goes by the name of the Jewish Federation of Metropolitan Chicago, so they're interchangeable. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of JUF and the Crown's family. Um, Center for Jewish and Israel Studies to the Klotznik Lecture. Um, it's been my privilege to um, be working on this lecture for I think close to 20 years and every year it's exciting to see who we bring and I particularly want to thank Northwestern University and my good friend Nancy who, Gelman who does a wonderful job of ensuring that everything comes off successfully so thank you Nancy. So the Jewish United Fund has a strong relationship with Northwestern University. I think a prime example is our Fiedler Hillel, which some of you are probably familiar with. Um, it's one of our premier Hillels in the country, and it's run under the wonderful leadership of Michael Simon, who happens to be sitting in the front row wearing purple, of course, because it's Northwestern University. So thank you, Michael. Um, I also wanted to give a couple other examples of how JUF interacts with Northwestern University. Um, in 2005, um, our Israel Studies project, um, working with the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences and the Crown Center for Jewish and Israel Studies, helped make possible a program that brings over Israeli postdocs, two postdocs a year, um, they alternate on various fields within um, academia, and I think that their integration into um, Northwestern has really um, kind of added some vibrancy and some really good content to academic life um, at the university. So we're really just pleased, again, to be partners in this. And these efforts are just a good example of a, what I think is a great community campus partnership. Um, this lecture, as Professor Eichenbach mentioned, is, um, was endowed by Philip M. and Ethel Klotznik um, in 1986. They really wanted to bring together um, the university and the community to come together to um, explore themes, issues within the Jewish community. And I think it's just been a really wonderful collaboration and we, you know, want this co to continue. So for those of you, I'll do a little shameless plug, for those of you who didn't RSVP or sign in, leaving your contact information, please do before you leave because that's a way that we can be in contact with you for future programs both by the Crown Center and by the Jewish Federation. Um, it's now my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Associate Professor Claire Sufrin. Um, she is the Assistant Director of the Crown Center, Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies here at Northwestern University. And Dr. Sufrin is a scholar of religion specializing in modern Jewish thought and theology. Thank you again for coming.
Okay, thank you, Paula. It's, it's wonderful to have so many of you here. I'm going to make the most important announcement of all, which is please silence your cell phones. And another logistical detail, I want to let you know that tonight's program will last about an hour, and then we will have a chance for some questions and answers, and then a uh, dessert reception outside on your way out. In addition, there will be CDs available uh, for sale um, if you are interested during the reception. Enough logistics. Welcome. Again, it is my pleasure to introduce Last Yiddish Heroes, Lost and Found Songs of Soviet Jews During World War II. It is also an even more so a pleasure to introduce Professor Anna, Anna Sternchis and Soy Korolenko, a performer based in uh, New Jersey and Moscow. Professor Anna Sternchis is the Al and Malka Green Associate Professor of Yiddish Studies and the director of the Ann Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Toronto. She earned her DPhil in Modern Language and Literatures from Oxford University in 2001. And she has written two books, Soviet and Kosher, Jewish Popular Culture in the Soviet Union. And just last year, When Sonia Met Boris, An Oral History of Jewish Life Under Stalin. As you can tell, she is an expert on Russian Jewish culture, on Jewish life within the Soviet Union, as well as post-Soviet Jewish life. Soy Korolenko is a poet, singer, and songwriter, as well as a scholar and journalist based um, in Moscow and New Jersey. He has embraced a hybrid career as a wandering scholar and singing professor. He writes and performs in Russian, Yiddish, French, and English, and I believe one or two other languages as well and in styles that include pop, folk, and rap. Reviewers and interviewers who have met him uh, before, before me have compared him to Allen Ginsberg, to Emil Zola, to Spike Jones, and to all of the Marx Brothers rolled into one. <laughs> so with a list like that, the only thing left to say is that he is truly one of a kind. Anna and Soy join us to share songs written in Yiddish during World War II and later hidden for decades. We are truly in for a treat. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Was is mir gekommen, die Show? Oi, wie ich geh ja rein in Stadt und frag, ob meine eigene Mann führte mir als keiner sie nicht auf. Oi, wie ich geh ja rein in Stadt und frag, ob meine eigene Mann führte mir als keiner sie nicht auf. Bin ich geblieben stehen, mit der Grohäuse gewöhnt, in Arznot geöffnet sich ein Wind. O in der Wasserseite ich gib, a guck, stellen mir sich vor, mein Weib mit meinem einzigen Kind. O in der Wasserseite ich gib, a guck, stellen mir sich vor, mein Weib mit meinem einzigen Kind. Was ist das für ein Zorn auf uns geworden? Was ist das für ein größer Gesar? Oi, von dem größten Zorn seinen viel Menschen aber geworden, die Verbliebene seinen Weg in Babi Jahr. Oi, von dem größten Zorn seinen viel Menschen aber geworden, die Verbliebene seinen Weg in Babi Jahr. Bei Nacht und Batok oben geklappt auf Tomaten, die Menschen oben gesehen versicht im Teut. Die Menschen oben gesehen versicht im Teut. Oi, Blut hat sich gegossen von alle Seiten, von Blut ist die Erde geworden reut. Oi, Blut hat sich gegossen von alle Seiten, von Blut ist die Erde geworden reut. 
der Grohoi sehr fähig, ist er fähig verblieben, wo es der Deutsch, wo es vergossen Blut. Oi, mit unsere Tränen soll die Erd verschlossen werden, als die Lebe, die Kessel schön werden gut. Oi, mit unsere Tränen soll die Erd verschlossen werden, als die Lebe, die Kessel schön werden gut. Ober unser Säune sucht wie er noch a Säune, er will mit sie machen in Hand. Er will mit sie machen in Hand. Oi, wie lang wie sie wollen leben, wollen sie das niederleben, sie wollen kein Mal nicht sein in unser Land. Oi, wie lang wie sie wollen leben, wollen sie das niederleben, sie wollen kein Mal nicht sein in unser Land. Oi, wie lang wie sie wollen leben, wollen sie das niederleben, sie wollen kein Mal nicht sein in unser Land. The song you just heard was first recorded from a woman named Golda Ravinska, who was 73 year old in Kiev in 1947. We don't know much about her, but she was probably one of 150,000 Jews from Kiev who survived the war somewhere away uh, from Ukraine, maybe in Central Asia, maybe close to Ural Mountains, and returned to Kiev only to find out that so much, so many of their family members were dead or gone to Babi Yar. Babi Yar, a ravine near Kiev, where 33,771 Jews were shot on September 29th of thir and 30th, 1941, in those two days. This number did not include, by the way, children under the age of three, so there probably more people killed uh, in the ravine. The story of a soldier coming back from the war and discovering an empty home were popular in the Soviet Union in 1945 in all languages. Many artists and authors and singers, including Mikhail Isakovsky, uh, addressed it. For example, Mikhail Isakovsky, not Jewish, a very famous Soviet songwriter, wrote the song called Enemies Burnt My House in 1945, where he tells a story of a soldier who comes back from the war, finds the grave of his wife, sits at her grave, drinks a little bit of vodka, and cries, saying that he liberated the entire Europe from fascism, but he was not able to protect his own family. Maybe Golda was inspired by that song, or maybe she had her own story. We don't know. We don't even know exactly to what tune she first sang it. The one that you heard right now in performance by Psoy Karolenka was, is based on a Yiddish tune called In Droysengate Aregen, uh, first recorded from Bronya Sakina, a Yiddish singer from Ukraine who immigrated to the United States in 1978. And she was discovered and popularized by Michael Alpert, uh, a klezmer musician who arranged and uh, taught her music. Something about the story of Golda Ravinska who laments her community resonated with songs by Bronny Sakina that lamented the loss of her love. This song, just like every other song you will hear tonight, is part of previously unknown archive left behind by the ethnomusicologists of Kiev Institute of Jewish Proletarian Culture who spent the entire World War II recording Yiddish music, stories, and jokes from Jews living and dying in the Soviet Union during its darkest chapter in modern history. Its members included Eli Spivak, world-famous Yiddish linguist, ethnomusicologist Moisei Berigovsky, and some others. 
Of six million Jews who were murdered during the Holocaust, two and, a, two and a half million were killed in the Soviet Union. Another 300,000 were killed either in combat or died as refugees. But also, 1.4 million Soviet Jews survived the war in the rare parts of the Soviet Union, parts of Central Asia, Ural Mountains, and Siberia. In addition to this 1,400,000 Soviet Jews, 250,000 Polish Jewish refugees survived the war also in the Soviet Union. Uh, as you know, all, uh, Jews of Poland, only 300,000 remained living after the war of the 3 million Polish Jews. So of those 300,000, 250,000 were in the Soviet Union, were refugees. And uh, some of the songs that you will hear tonight come from these people as well. A little less known is a story which is appropriate to tell now, just the day before, two days before the 9th of May, the day that's customary celebrated as the Victory Day in the Soviet Union, uh, that about half a million Jews served in the Red Army. Berigovsky and his team recorded hundreds of songs in Yiddish during the war that reflected on all these experiences. They planned to publish some of these songs into a volume, into a book, which was all typed and set up. It was called Jewish Creativity in the Soviet Union During a Great Patriotic War. I can show you this beautiful, sexy cover. As you can see, it's all ready for publication. Um, it was all typed out. It even went for one round of uh, Stalin's censorship, but it never actually came out. As the book was being prepared, uh, uh, Soviet Yiddish weekly Anikite uh, published a short article in 1942 saying that Berigovsky and his colleagues are collecting Yiddish songs uh, about the war. And very soon after that, Berigovsky and others started getting letters from people in the Red Army or some people from occupied Ukraine or from all over Central Asia. They looked something like this, like you see on your screen. Those handwritten letters were, docu were songs uh, talking about what was happening to Jews. So these letters became part of that archive, uh, the archive of the Institute of Jewish Proletarian Culture. The archive was, um, uh, for, I will tell you the story of it a little bit later, but um, the archive was not known to historians, not very well known at least, uh, until about uh, 15 years ago we learned that actually it exists, but only until one, uh, maybe two or three years ago that it became clear that this archive, the entire archive of these materials actually survived the war. And we came across these documents about three years ago, and we quickly realized three, four, th four, things, four things. First of all, Every single song written, collected in this uh, project was written by amateur authors. No professional songwriters, no professional poets wrote any of these songs. The second thing we discovered, that not a single one of the songs of the archive was known before. And to give it a little bit of context, there are a lot of Holocaust music is available to us. There are songs from Vilna Ghetto. There are songs from Lodge Ghetto. There are songs from Warsaw Ghetto. There are songs that are unknown, that exist, that were, that, uh, that were written in the different places where Jews were during the war, including under the German occupation. So we thought that maybe some of the songs will be similar or familiar. That was not true. Not a single one was known before the archive was found. The third thing we realized, that some of the songs were written as early as 1941, which means that some of the first documents documenting atrocities against Jews in Ukraine or western part of Russia were actually songs. People found it easier sometimes to document what they were witnessing writing music about it, rather than telling prose. Somehow prose lacked the emotional power that they needed, which music readily gave them. 
That observation meant the third thing, that the existence of this archive is revising the way we understand the history of the Holocaust in the Soviet Union. For example, we learn that Red Army soldiers, Jews under the German or Romanian occupation, or Soviet evacuees were using Yiddish in order to make sense of what was going on with them, and they wrote songs in Yiddish. Before the archive was discovered, we didn't know that this was true. Finally, the fourth thing that we realized was that these songs were never heard from, since 1947, and they needed to find the audience beyond a strictly academic one. The songs had to be brought back to life as music, as art. And here came the difficulty. Most of the documents looked like that. Which, you know, you can see handwritten Yiddish, some of you can read it, um, but you see there are no notes. So how do we know exactly to which tune, tune it should be sang? Berigovsky did not finish this project, so they were planned to add uh, tunes later. Sometimes they didn't have time to record these tunes. Sometimes people who mailed those songs to them didn't write the tunes. So. Um, the problem was, how exactly do you sing the poem? Berigovsky started making annotations to this music. For example, sometimes it would say, sang to a famous Soviet song, but it doesn't say which one. Uh, or another important piece of information that came from Berigovsky who said that not a single new tune was recorded. In other words, people relied on old, popular Yiddish and Soviet and Ukrainian and Polish and Romanian music, and as we learned later, also German music, which is also very interesting, to write these new Yiddish songs about the war. So, with this in mind, and uh, using a leap of imagination, Psoy and I, and I'm being very generous to myself, actually 99% of it, this work was done by Psoy, brought uh, these songs, uh, th imagine the tunes for these songs, sometimes based on textual analysis, sometimes uh, taking a leap of imagination and something ta sometimes taking a real leap of imagination and uh, singing them to the tunes that didn't exist then or something that was popular in the 19th century. You'll see. Above all, this program is meant to do something that we think the authors of the songs wanted to do, to create an artistic and musical commentary on the darkest chapter of Soviet Jewish history and also European Jewish history. So the next song you're about to hear uh, is right in this, uh, in this line. It provides a co commentary on events that were relevant to its author, Vel Velvel Shargarotsky, a man, um, a 42-year-old man who is uh, singing that in Krasnodar region of Russia in 1944, and uh, it talks about things that he is reading about in the newspaper and something that he wants to put in verse. So first you'll listen and then I'll explain a little bit more. <laughs> Greenem <laughs> 
мороз, шмейн зих дітає чола, хоробки лос нос. Ну воже фарво яке зай підохацім, ех фунали зай ні за зохун веюн вінт. Донід штей, у донід кей, ой, це знід гуд. Тай члан ти завцоре з Гітлері з капут. Тай члан ти завцоре з Гітлері з капут. So as you can see, the song talks, written in 1944, I'm reminding, uh, speaks of Hitler's desire to get Soviet oil in Caucasus and uh, in Donbas region of Ukraine. And there's a nice rhyme there, the oil, the word the oil, the, the use Russian word for it, neft, rhymes with geschäft, um, you know, oil with business. Um, so the song actually has an unusually contemporary feel because we still hear the words like you know, oil and coal and resources in the news today. We hear the word Caucasus, we hear the word Crimea, and we hear the word you know, war in Ukraine, except the sides are different, but these sites are still the places of, uh, uh, of um, uh, ethnic and, um, uh, and uh, of ethnic violence and ethnic conflict. Interestingly, if you read the, rely on English translation to read this, uh, the lyrics of the songs, you'll notice that there's nothing there about Jews. You know, there are no Jewish heroes, there are no Jewish victims. The song talks about what the newspapers are reporting. So if you, we don't know the song is written in Yiddish and we don't think about the tune, then it could be in any language written in the Soviet Union in 1944. But the tune actually tells a different story. The tune, uh, suggests that very clearly that the song is based on the old Yiddish folk song Affenhoichenbarg on a tall mountain, popular in the 19th century, even, even uh, Mendel Moichus Forum, a Yiddish writer, uh, wrote about that song in his novel Fishke the Lame, so it's a very old Yiddish song. And that Yiddish song is a riddle where a Moschilic Jew, uh, when a Hasidic Jew makes fun of a Moschilic Jew by calling them Deitch, so the Deitch. So um, it's an inner Jewish quarrel. But when the war comes, the Deutsch, the Moschilic Jew, becomes actually a real German and Deutsch. And the song uses this old form in order to tell a very new story. Now, the um, next song you're about to hear was, is one of the few in this program today that was published. It was published in this book, uh, edited by Sholem Cooper Schmidt, called uh, Folk Songs from the Great Patriotic War. It, the book came out in 1944. It was recorded from Berta Flaxman in, Jito, in Jitomir, in, um, from Jitomir, but she recorded it in Uzbekistan, in 1943. Uh, the tune will surprise you a little, but I will not say too much. Oh, you hear it. Von dem Eintiker Milchome will ich Lieder singen. As me soll die ganze Welt mit die Lieder klingen. Wie es vorgekommen Schlagen sich mit einem Feind auf Messer. Als sind, vor sich die mörderische Zores. Hat er bald geschworen, sei kurz machen die Schure. Svor ich eich, fara pažner, keile pase svetmen, fun eich schneiden, wie funane. 
As you can see, the song does not uh, exactly shy away from violent calls for death to the enemy. I'm putting that slide back on screen. So I want to tell you a little story about this. So a few years ago, two years ago, we were invited to perform this program on Canadian um, classical musical radio station. And uh, I was asked by a host to write two-line summary of each song. So we chose this song by, with a tune by Mikhail Glinka, and I'll tell you more about this in a second. So I had to summarize this song in two lines. So I wrote this, as anyone would. Um, the song is about how you should kill as many Germans as possible without mercy. And many songs in this project are summarized that way. So the host um, um, called me for a meeting, very formal, very kind of... Uh, uh, classical music appropriate meeting, and he says to me, so I want to ask you something. You realize it's a family station. <laughs> uh, he says, maybe we should tone it down a little. Do you think it's appropriate to play music like this for our audience? And I said to him that I think that for the first time in history of Yiddish music, it's being criticized for not for its vulgarity, not for its t low taste, but actually for violence. And I think I said to him, we have to stop and pause and think that this is a historic moment. And he said, okay, fine, we'll play it. <laughs> um, so uh, why, why uh, Glinka? Now, the uh, song is set, the one you heard is uh, Skylark, the 19th century uh, song by Mikhail Glinka, which was wildly popular in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. It was performed by Sergei Lemeshev, a famous Soviet singer who is often understood as Soviet sex symbol. Everyone knew him, everyone wanted to be Lemeshev. 
So we were thinking about this woman, Bertha Flaxman, who's writing this song, encouraging a soldier to fight for Odessa. Yoshke from Odessa is the bravest one who has no mercy for, en for enemies. And she imagines him, this tall and handsome, looking like Sergei Lemeshev, and singing, pretending to be Lemeshev, and singing this song to the Skylark tune. And that's how it came to be. This tenor, this, uh, this kind of music was popular also among Yiddish tenors in the Soviet Union. Um, Zinovi Shulman, Salomon Krom, Chisko Misha Aleksandrovich sang songs like Skylark. So we believe that this is historic enough. Now, revenge is a central theme in this Red Army songs. These are the songs, this one and the next one you're about to hear that motivates soldiers to fight, to abandon their human side, and to remember that Germans are not human because they are doing things that no human being should ever do. By the way, the person who came up with the slogan, kill the German, was Ilya Ehrenborg, a famous Soviet journalist, also of Jewish origin, who published a famous article in 1942 called Kill the German, and many Russian songs and Ukrainian songs, and now, as we learned from this archive, Yiddish songs, took lines from this article, translated them into the language, and sang them. But what Yiddish songs have, that other songs don't have quite as much. They have the message that was really important for the authors of the songs to come to bring across. And that is that Jews do, can and do fight as men, and they do it no worse than other soldiers. In other words, fighting a very wrong but very popular anti-Semitic myth that spread in the Soviet Union in the 1940s that Jews sit out the war in Tashkent, while others are fighting to protect them. This myth has no historical evidence, but um, a myth does not need a historical evidence. So the songs are fighting against it and showing that Jews are actually uh, very good and brave soldiers. Um, so the next song that you're about to hear is actually written by a soldier in the Red Army, by a Polish Jewish refugee whose name is Mendel Mann. Later he became a famous artist and also a poet, became friends with Marc Chagall, but he didn't know that then. In 1944, he wrote a song that you're about to hear where he glorifies his machine gun. Ligi chleb pulimiot un šepča jidiš nigu, a runi rizal štil un skundi grizlov zahvig, a runi rizal štil nor stundi grizlov zahvig, dar man zih man freilak šteto, vero te se nidi kikem. It's dieses pustohen Menschen, moje seinen die Stieber verbrennt. Nor sis do arroite armei, on si mir a pulimiot gegeben. To schlog ich und schlog ich die Deutschen, kede unser Volk soll doch leben. Oi schlog ich und schlog ich die Deutschen, Kde ale andere felker zol lepn, o ir viste menšu frese, o ir tajči še bantitn, eh pulimiot ci hil besar, zol stukin tajčni toj smitn, o ir viste menšu frese, o ir tajči še bantitn, hej pulimiot ci hil besar. So as you can see, the song really likes the machine gun. And um, it's interesting to think about this, why it matters so much in 1944. 
Today, if any one of you has gone to Israel and have seen, you know, you get off the airplane, you see a lot of young men and women holding guns, and, and this combination of words of Jews and guns is no longer a novelty. Or, I realize now that I'm talking in the United States, the guns is a big contested issue. But, in 1944, a Jew having a machine gun and using this machine gun to fight against the army that destroys their people is a huge deal. And many, if not all, our Red Army songs glorify the weapons that are given to them by the Red Army. Now, this song, as you could see, really talks about avenging Jewish people. It's talking about how important it is for the soldier to, uh, to fight for Jews. When Berigovsky and, uh, and his team was preparing the book for publication, I mentioned earlier that it went for a round of, of censorship. So they looked at the song, and the, the motivation was there, the fighting was there, it was all good, but it seemed a little bit too Jewish for the climate of the Soviet Union of 1940s. It's not that those ethnomusicologists or scholars were working exactly in the atmosphere of the academic freedom. They had to think about what will be published in the Soviet Union. So they made some changes, so I'm going to show you. So this is a document from the archive. First they type the original song, and then they cross some stuff out. So what's typed at first is that when he says, I'm going to fight so that my Jewish people should survive. Like I'm fighting for my Jewish people. They cross it out, and they write on top, Unsere Felker, which means that instead of my people, our people's removing Jews from the song. So we had a dilemma. How do we sing it today? Do we sing it the way Mendelman wanted it to be sang, and that's why and that's why we give voice to him and honor his work? Or do we sing it how Berigovsky would have published that song, and had this book come out, we would have uh, sang it this way, and therefore honor the work of scholars that did everything that they could to preserve this folklore. So because it's not a purely commercial or a, a project, we decided to go the academic way, and that's why those of you who listened closely heard that Psoe sings both versions. So first he sings for my Jewish people, and then he sings for all people. And we think that in the 21st century, this message of universal dangers of fascism to Jews and to non-Jews is actually very relevant. And entertaining. And I'll talk about more about this later. Um, in 1944, all workers of the, uh, of the Institute came back to the war-torn Kiev. Ukraine lost almost 900,000 Jews to Holocaust. In the German-occupied Ukraine, less than 1% of Jews survived. In the Romanian-occupied Ukraine, about 30% of Jews survived. So during 1944, 45, 46, and 47, Moisei Berigovsky, Ruvim Lerner, Hina Shargarotsk, and a few other of his colleagues went to the places in Ukraine where Jews still survived and even went to DP camp in, in Germany and recorded stories, folk songs, and anything that could become part of this project. It was not an easy task. People who survived the war under the German or Romanian occupation were afraid to talk about what happened to them during the war for a good reason. As early as 1942, Soviet secret police issued a secret but very effective statement saying that every Jew who survived the war under the German occupation has to be interrogated and they have to prove that they survived by not collaborating with the German army. If they couldn't prove otherwise, they were arrested and sent to Soviet jail. People who did survive the war under the German occupation or Romanian occupation, who had documents linking them to those ghettos and camps, burned those documents as soon as the rumor of this instruction, of this, uh, of this uh, order became known to them. They regretted this decision many years later when the Material Claims Conference against Germany started issuing pensions to Holocaust survivors and the Soviet Holocaust survivors couldn't prove anything. But in 1945, they didn't think about that. They wanted to live, and they wanted their children to live, and they wanted to live normal life. So they lied 
A lot of people who survived the war under the German occupation or Romanian occupation said that they survived the war in Central Asia, in Tashkent, contributing, by the way, to this myth of Jews surviving the war in, in, in Tashkent. So who would sing them the songs of the war? So the stories they wouldn't tell, but they would sing songs. They would say, my neighbor sang that song to me. My neighbor, who I don't know where he is or where she is, she told me that she learned that song from a ghetto or from a camp. And that's how we have Yiddish music created in those camps and ghettos from Ukraine. One of those uh, sites in Ukraine where a lot of Jews perished, where a lot of Jews from Romania and other parts of Ukraine were deported to and died, was called Pechora. Pechora is a small town in Vinitsa region of Ukraine. And uh, during the war, they took this tuberculosis sanatorium and they emptied it of patients, and they started sending Jews there, dispatching them. There was no mass murders in Pechora, but what happened was that people were sent there, they were not fed, and within weeks they would die, and then new groups will arrive. Some people, especially children, very few of them were able to escape Pechora uh, and uh, tell the story of it. So a lot of, uh, a lot of songs in the archive actually talk about Pechora. After the war, uh, Soviet authorities denied the existence of Pechora. Historians uh, today even argue whether it was a ghetto, whether it was a concentration camp. Survivors call it death camp. So there's a lot of discussion. But these songs are very clear. There's no doubt on what it was. Pechora in this song is a place from where no one comes back alive. One such song, one, the next song that you're about to hear, is a very special song. It was recorded from a teenager named Josef Broverman, who was 16 years old in 1944 when the researchers found him. And he said to them that he was interned in Pechora together with his parents. His parents died in 1942. He himself escaped Pechora in 1943. But he said to them that he wrote that song in 1942, the day after his parents were killed. And this is the song you're about to hear, again, with an interesting tune, of which I will say nothing for now. Kommt heute schön mal nach der Mone, unser frier dicke Zeit, unser Maso, unser Leben, was hat uns am Unser Mulke, unser Weinen, una Schiru non ane. Oi, oi, meine junge Jorn, gehen jetzt beim Deutsch ave. Wachsen Zweigen werden grün. Hat am Allersäu gezwittert unser Leben in Tulchin. Kommt die Zeit und von die Bäume flieht der schöne Zwitaro. Punkt der Säu, das Licht die Kleine Geht bei uns als Witte Wo du stehst nicht, wo du gehst nicht, gäumen Menschen auf dem Weg. Es wird nur scheinen unser Leben, wie in die Frier die Gedeck. Oi, die Eltern, die soi mir Blonden sich allein herum und das blutig Wort gestorben, wo du kommst, die Summe du. Menschen fallen wie die Fliegen, nur warum der Fuhn verkehrt, unser Mucke, unser Zorn. 
wissen wir die ganze Welt. Kein Mann soll nicht sein Verfall, das um schuldig jüdisch blieb. Wo sie wird hat sind vergessen in Europa Bombardiert. Norder weiß Goimen Menschen in Petschere auf dem Weg. Los uns scheinen das Licht die Kleben von der Frier die Sorgen mit dem Tofkis in der Hand. So the song, The Ballad of Destruction of Tolchin, a small town in Ukraine, before the war it had a Jewish population of 3,000, of them only 20 survived the war and the song tells the story of the destruction. Uh, the tune, and by the way, before I tell you about the tune, uh, as you can see, the teenager who wrote that song was hopeless. He didn't see the good ending. He, he thought that everyone will forget about uh, what happened to, this, to him and to his community. But then the end is very positive, and it says we will uh, respond to the murders, we will resist, we will have guns in their hands. And you know, for some time it didn't make any sense to me because the whole song is so depressing, and then the last verse is like so a bit. And sure enough, it comes as a sponsorship, as, as a censorship. Uh, as you can see, the depressing lines are cut out, as the documents I found later, and this whole last verse about using the guns and fighting and to respond to murder to murder was written by scholars themselves in order to show that people are actually not losing their spirit and are resisting fascism. And again, we sing both versions. Now the tune was written, of course, by Alfred Schnitke, a Soviet composer of both German and Jewish origin, written in 1978. So how could it be this song that set to the tune? It comes from a famous uh, TV series, um, um, uh, popular in the, in, the, in the Soviet Union in the 70s, uh, uh, based on Pushkin's uh, uh, stories, uh, Bush, Bushkin's little tragedies. And the song by Schmidtke talks about a destroyed community due to Black Plague in the 14th century. The fascism was referred to as the Brown Plague during the war, so, so I thought this was, uh, uh, it was be interesting to sing this ballad of distraction to this modern contemporary tune. And that's how this uh, CD song got recorded, and, uh, and we're very happy with the message it sends and all this. Until, you know, a few months ago, we found the original tune of that song. Turned out that, oh well, to say that we were wrong is not to say um, much. It turns out that this kid was singing this song to a very famous Cossack song, um, <laughs> which talked about, it's called, uh, well, the Russian speakers here will appreciate this, Tien uh, Karazin. It's, uh, it's a song uh, known to us uh, from the 1990s as a drunken song, but then in the 1940s, it's a song about this Cossack uh, leader uh, killing his girlfriend on a dare from brothers, from his uh, soldier brothers. And this, so this is a very you know, chauvinistic, misogynistic, so like, in all this kind of song, and it was even used as a German uh, song as well. In the German army, it was aviation march and all this. How this kid connected these kind of words with that music escapes us. But we know two things for sure. First, we would have never guessed it. And second, had we sang it like this today, you would have all thought that we're mocking this project, and how could that be? So what worked for 1944 does not work for 2018, and we think that maybe Josef Brovermann, had he lived, had he heard this, said, actually, it sounds better with Schnitke. We want to live with that and believe that. One of the things, speaking of surprises from the archive, that surprised us, looking at the songs in the archive, is how much humor was in them. 
Humor and satire were a very important part of uh, making sense of the war and trying to cope with the war, and some people even say resisting the war. Holocaust survivors often talk about how if they could make a joke, that gave them strength to live to see another day. Soviets saw humor as a very powerful weapon against fascism. Soviet uh, magazines published cartoons like this one all the time, defeating Hitler, suffocating Hitler like this. So Yiddish songs don't stay away from this. In fact, about 30% of the archive are actually humorous songs. So the next one you're about to hear uses the traditional Jewish framework for, frame of reference for humor, and that is the holiday of Purim. In fact, the song is called Shalachmonis for Hitler, Purim Gifts for Hitler. It was recorded in Kazakhstan in 1945. And the tune is Binich Schneider of the comic Dittis about uh, uh, about different uh, people of different uh, trades, people of different professions, which actually fail as such, right? So this Homan is a Homan who failed. Du bist nit mein erster Seine, hab geat, a Sacha Seine, will noch verschreib moi dein Nomen. In him Zettel was heaped the horn mit Omen, Omen, Antiochus, Turk, Vimade, Krushevan, Ogn, the world, for hippest, freer, no for dear. A langer Zettel, Omen, sis, for an, Svet, Nistayen, kein Papier. Ot, ihr alle sich hat Ziel gestellt, Mich hob zu mecken, von der Welt, nor nicht on neich is es gewähnt. Stalin wird schon kurz neich die Hand. Mein Häus, aus du verbrennt, aus du meine Töchter geschenkt, aus du meine Eifelig zertrot, nun geschworen mich Häus zu rot. Nor will du Narish is ein Beiser Träum, mir wellen Leben sei wie sei, dein Soft wird sein auf Homens Bäume, Amis Rolchai. So as you can see, the song recites all the failed enemies of Jews. Uh, Haman Antiochus, I don't explain, but Khrushchevan, uh, Pavel Khrushchevan, the alleged author of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. So all these heroes are here and they all end up poorly. So the last, but one story that I will tell you about this song is that the last line, Amis Royal High, was not there originally. In fact, the document looked like this. So it, it said that it will, your end will be on Haman's tree. So Psoi, when he was working with this song, he said to me, you know, it doesn't quite end right. I want to add something. I'm going to add Amos Royal High. I said, absolutely not. It goes against everything of this material. Soviet Jews will never say Amos Royal High. It was not relevant to them. It will completely destroy the project. And so he didn't listen to me. He sang it. And then the audience, the audience loved it. This was our bestseller. Like, I mean, this is people. So, so I sold my soul, academic soul, to the commercial success and let it be. <laughs> later, later, uh, I found the original of the song, handwritten one. And those of you who read Yiddish <laughs> can see the last line. As you can see loud and clearly. <laughs> The last line is Amos Royal High, which taught me, well, first, humility, never too late, and second, a very important lesson, that an artist gets another artist much better than a historian gets an artist. <laughs> and this is the whole point of this project, to give an artistic voice to people who never got the chance to actually sing the songs. Uh, and by the way, 
I was not the only one who didn't think it doesn't fit. You see, Birigovsky crossed it out. And then the version of the song was published in 1968 in Sovetish Hamelan, and they too took it out. They took Purim out, Haman out, everything out. But, so there was this moment in history when Jews could still say that, wanted to say it, and could sing it. It lasted maybe a year, maybe a year and a half, but the songs are those time capsules that give us a chance to get uh, into the world of Soviet Jews who never got to tell their story after, because maybe they didn't remember, maybe they couldn't, but this is what the songs give us an opportunity to do. So the next uh, piece that you're going to hear uh, is actually not a song, but a joke, uh, recorded by Hirsch Blostein, uh, an Argentinian journalist who spent the war in the Soviet Union, long story. He wrote an article in 1943 where he said that 1943 will be famous in modern Jewish history for the blossoming Yiddish humor. Um, so this is the, the joke that he recorded. Als Hitler oder Sender sein Geschäft ist kaputt, oder sich zu geklebt, aber sie kommt getan vom Jiddischlöch. Sich der Wust bei Gebelsen, wo es ist noch geblieben, ein lebendiger Jid in der dritten Imperie. Und gekommen zu ihm, behalt mich, Brüder! Hat er gesagt zum Jeden, behalt mich, Bruder, oh Bruder, behalt mich. Hitlers Menschen jagen sich noch mir. Dem Jeden ist bald geworden verdächtig der ganze Linie. Er hat noch nicht gehört, besitzt, als ein Jeden soll sagen auf Hitlers Äußerwurfen, Menschen. Chaias, ja. Hint, jo, Paskudniakis, jo, Azeri, jo, aber nicht Menschen. Kein Narr ist der Jid nicht gewähnt, sagt er zu seinem Baldover Azoi. Ihr seht doch Väter, als allein ob ich mich euch behalten bei Hadr Hadoris und dazu ob ich in ganzen Arab geworfen dem jüdischen Parze von sich, keu dem Kohl, muss ich euch Arab nehmen, die Bord und überlassen nach Stickelach von uns. Und jeder noch Hitler hat bei Wissen etwas zu entfernen. Hat der jeder Streich getan, die Hand in der Bord bei Hitler und oben genommen sie den Herrn und fies. Und das hat ihm ein ganz Neues gegeben. Und der jeder hat gesagt, ich hab schon gesehen, Ziegen mit Bert. Nee, nee, das ist natürlich. Hab schon noch viele gesehen, Bert mit Bert, mit jüdischer Bert in die Hand. Aber ein jüdischer Bord auf ein hintischer Morde hab ich noch keinmal nicht gesehen. Takova mi ischio nie videli. Und der Witz endet sich mit Agramm. Jo Bord, nicht Bord, da geht nicht in kein Bord. Dein einziger Ort ist in der Erd. The book that Birigovsky and his colleagues prepared was never published. Hitler was gone, but Stalin, who the songs praise so wholeheartedly, now changed his attitudes to Jews. Jews were now seen not as allies of the Soviet state, but as enemies of the Soviet Union. In 1949, the Cabinet for Jewish Culture was closed. Its director, Eli Spivak, was arrested and died during interrogations of 1950. In 1950, Moisei Berigovsky was arrested too, only to be released in 1956. In the 50s, it became dangerous to speak about Yiddish culture in public, and no state funding was available, of course, to conduct research on Jewish studies. The material that they had collected was seized and made secret and deposited in the manuscript depart section of the Ukrainian National Library, where it was unavailable to researchers until 1990s. 
Today, we wanted to tell you about these songs, not just to alert you to the entire layer of culture of Yiddish-speaking Jews that developed during the war, of which we had no idea, and which similarly to Yiddish cultures of Vilna, Warsaw, and other Polish ghettos, reflected a strong desire of Jews to fight against fascism, to revenge the dead, and to remember their loved ones, but also to honor the heroic people who preserved these songs for us. When they were arrested, they believed that their collection was gone forever. Uh, I spoke recently with Berigovsky's granddaughter who lives in Ukraine, and she says that she remembers her grandfather poorly. She was a little girl when he, di when he died. And she says she remembers one thing about him, that he was always working, and her grandmother, his wife, was yelling at him all the time for that. He came from jail, he was sitting with his papers, he was sorting them out, and she would say to him, nobody will ever need any of your work. You should not be you know, making your eyes hurt, you should not be working, it's useless, useless, useless. And he is sad, and he spent the last five years of his life sorting the archive, his other archive, the one that he, the project that he worked on during the war, he never ever told his family that he was doing that because he worried, rightly so, I think, that because of this project, he was actually arrested because there was so much Jewish nationalism in this music, not enough Soviet, that he worried that if he mentioned something to his family, they will suffer as well. So he died thinking that this document never uh, will actually were destroyed. Thankfully, he and his colleagues were wrong. Yes, it's over 70 years later, after the archive was closed, but the songs did see the light of day, and for that we're grateful. To him, the Berigovsky and his colleagues for their work, and to you for your attention tonight. We will finish with uh, one song from this collection, also a Purim song, that proudly proclaims the end of Hitler and the end of fascism. Sumnayem yorkon hidala habzure aichon zogn Genukun schon zu yomern, genukun schon zu klogn Genukun schon zu yomern, genukun schon zu klogn Genuk schon zu baweinen, unsere liebe Teute Die Euberant wird nehmen schon, die Arme, die Reute Die Euberant wird nehmen schon Arme die Reute, Hitler kann uns Herden nur banacht in hohem, a Sochen weh wird ihm sein, a se wird werden scholem, a Sochen weh wird ihm sein, a se wird werden scholem. Scholem Frieden auf der Welt, dem Deutschen auf Zerloches, dem Deutschen Abzelochus, Hitler und Wartmann in Hitz und Kelt und erkennen uns Kuschen in Tochus. Hitler und Wartmann in Hitz und Kelt und erkennen uns Kuschen in Tochus. Soy Karalenka. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you're. Uh, okay. So we do have another song. I don't know if you want. <laughs> okay, now this is the very last song for real, um, and this is a song that, in our opinion signals the return to real normalcy in Jewish culture. It was recorded in a German DP camp, not in the Soviet Union, 1946, 
and it makes fun of Jewish organizations that are helping Jewish survivors to you know, get back on their feet. So it's back to the citation of two Jews, three opinions, and making fun of each other. And uh, musically, in this song, we celebrate uh, radical anachronistic solutions and uh, other random songs. And it, it is actually, in this case, it's some kind of a medley. Uh, there are three tunes, at least. Uh, the Russian popular tune known as Mishka Mnoga uh, some sort of Tsiganochka, the Russian Roma gypsy dance song, and a little bit of Tumbala Laik. Он гикумен кин Берлин, ни та еру, ни та ин. Он ме форт, ме форт, ме форт, ой, он ме зиц но хопей норт. Ме лойв цум джойнт, ме лойв цум ребм, ер кен зих нит кей не гейн цей гебм. Зог не вие слі беро. Svet zajni tuns der sov, oj liber bruder nor bitochn, mir ce še moha porvochn, ves tu zajno pjener zajt, un fun dog vi šojn, all right. Un in džojn der stari pjos, un zgiter nit kaj nent fer na vaporov, Sume zokti ma za zokun ve, ume interaze si z ok. Zorgnit, zorgnit si z noh gut, vos do abocher fun sahnut. Es ir nora hvat kerjat, gita era sertifikat, no haren shain izun, veisn mir shoin lang dar fun, parliert mer tak ni te mut, abi mit jekes is kaput, abi Berlin is stark zisterd, liegt Nei neil in der Erde, on ich es ruel tanz und schrei, eure Hand ist ruel chei. Lang woch noch gewen mein Lied, nor ich bin schei net was mit. Es wird sein da je nu da. Hit raz, adieu, goodbye. Okay, we're going to take a, maybe three questions before we uh, bring the program to a close. Nancy Gelman has, Nancy, over here we have a couple of microphones. I apologize in advance, we won't be able to call on everyone. But if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand. Oh, oh there's uh, Nancy over here, right towards the back. During uh, the same terrible period in which these songs emerged, uh, the Soviet Yiddish poets, who later would be killed by Stalin, uh, Pfeffer, Markish, and others, were writing both uh, poems which were criticizing Hitler uh, and, of course, praising Stalin, with little bits of Jewish nationalism in them for which they paid a terrible price. Did you find any evidence that the people whom you were researching had knowledge of the Soviet Yiddish poetry being written uh, at that time under official auspices? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know what, thank you for that question because uh, the answer is uh, absolutely not. In fact, it, it was something that we really looked for. Uh, my, I have a colleague, uh, Gennady Estreich, a specialist in Soviet Yiddish literature and culture working at, out of NYU. When I just first found the songs, he says to me, oh, Itzik Pfeffer wrote all the songs. They pretended for them to be folk songs, and it is what it is. Well, actually, that turned out to be not true because Itzik Pfeffer would never write songs of such low artistic quality. You know, he was a professional <laughs> poet. But what was interesting to me is that comparing songs written by Itzik Pfeffer, by Peretz Markish, by, um, uh, I'm trying to think of, uh, of um, uh, other Yiddish uh, um, poets writing during this time, or even stories by Bergel Solder Nister, there's nothing there. They borrow their imagery from popular Russian songs or from the old Yiddish songs, but there is no interaction, and that's how we concluded. Also, we looked every single name up hoping maybe some of them will become Yiddish uh, poets or singers, none. And that to us showed us that this was this complete layer of amateur Yiddish culture, which lived in a different universe compared to the universe of Pfeffer and Markish and Kvitko and all these other people. Thank you. So I was working on a book on uh, uh, Yiddish culture in the Soviet Union during World War II. I'm still working, well, I'm still not working on this book, um, because I went to Kiev to look for the, for the documents, for the archive, and, uh, um, and then the librarian showed them to me, and that's, uh, that's how I discovered them. <laughs> so it was not my discovery. We'll take one more, maybe from this side of the room, right in front. My mother teaches Sunday school. She's, in the, she's Russian herself. She's going to be embarrassed that I'm asking this question. But I, I guess I'm confused, just historically-wise, from the 1940s until the 1950s. I didn't realize that Jewish people were fitting in in the Soviet Union, per se. And was it state-funded? How did that work? I'm surprised that people were actually researching that in the first place. So that is a very interesting question because actually Barry Govsky and everyone who worked on that project were paid salary by the Ukrainian Academy of Science throughout the war until the cabinet was closed. And it's interesting to think about how the war is going on and things are, things are in, in complete chaos but Berigovsky and his team are on the train that takes them away from the war zone and takes them to Central Asia. Uh, the project, they, they don't have to do this project. They could do other things. They could, uh, and they did, like they developed, they were collecting Bashkir, Bashkirian folklore, they were collecting Kyrgyz folklore, and they were doing, working on all that, but they're also working on Yiddish music. And this work is funded by the state. And I want to say that it's probably the only European country at that time that spends its money collecting Yiddish music. Please join me in thanking Soy Karolenko and Anna Strenchis.